to episode 12 of the Powerhouse Podcast, where we bring to you the powerhouses in the mitochondrial world. I'm your host, Brian Harmon, President and CEO of the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation. Joined, as always, by my esteemed co-host, Dr. Phil Yeski, our Science Alliance Officer. Phil, it's been a busy 2022 already, hasn't it? Fair to say, yes. <laughs> here, here, here we are. Uh, already uh, February kind of moving by and uh, you know, lots of exciting things happening, but uh, boy, uh, it, time really uh, goes by quickly. Well, we're just warming up, really. I mean, just to recap yeah. a little bit of the activity that's happened here in 2022 already. Last month, when we had our new director of marketing and advocacy on Andy Durth, we were talking about the patient listening session that was coming up and what, what an inspiring event. Wow. That's the only way I can describe this. You know, so important. We're going to talk about this with our guests today about that voice of the patient and right. making sure our friends at the FDA hear that patient voice as they're making decisions on advancing therapies. And we had the, um, I guess I call it the responsibility of bringing the voice of the TK2D community to um, the FDA and bringing right. a panel of patients to share the disease. I, I left that that meeting ready to run through a wall. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's a lot of work to, you know, to prepare for it, to, uh, you know, get the panelists selected. But, you know, on game day, uh, the ability of those patients and caregivers to be able to just speak from the heart, right, about what it is to either live with the disease or take care of a loved one uh, affected by the disease, uh, what meaningful treatments mean to them, you know, what risk they're willing to uh, accept for, for a given benefit. These are not easy things to right. do. And they did it so eloquently. And, and, and as I said, just you know, kind of straight from the heart that I, I really felt like uh, it, it was impactful, uh, as you described it. Well, I applaud the courage of those patient families and, and be on the lookout for a, a report of that meeting coming soon as well, too, as it's important that we capture that information and make sure it's a, a resource for the FDA and for those who are helping advance treatments and ultimately a cure um, for our community. Another exciting project that we're right in the thick of is this genetic testing project. We talked about right. this last couple of months. And, you know, we, we, we talk often about that, you know, the house that Jack built to get get drugs over the finish right. line and, and, a, and a confirmed diagnosis is, is right at the beginning of the construction of that house. Exactly. Right. You know, the, 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 this, this is the step one, right. That we, we need to have a robust cohort of patients that are genetically confirmed uh, with having mitochondrial disease because the criteria for entering um, any clinical trial associated with mitochondrial disease is going to require that. Right. Uh, it's going to be part of the uh, eligibility criteria. So, you know, we feel like this, this is an area that a patient advocacy group like UMDF can make a difference by trying to bring programs, uh, you know, to the marketplace that give the opportunity for those who, for whatever reason, have been unable to have genetic testing performed. Um, you know, they, they now have the chance to get that test, get a diagnosis that's meaningful to them as a human and as a patient. But obviously, it also puts them into a very special category now of saying clinical trial ready. And if you're a patient family on that diagnostic journey, be sure to check out our social media, check those inboxes. You know, we're approaching nearing 70% of this program filling up here. We want to make sure that we get um, our community in line with that to take take advantage of um, this really nice opportunity. And speaking of that too, just great opportunities, Phil. The uh, the Lee Syndrome Roadmap Project is one that we continue to advance. Um, this is a, a big project with our partners from around the globe, leading patient advocacy groups coming together to advance Lee Syndrome. We'll probably get into that a little bit today with uh, today's guests as well. Um, but I know we recently just handed out some grants for this year as well. Yeah, we did. It was $150,000 U.S. dollar pool in, in total. Uh, we made five awards. Um, th these are investigators sort of dotted uh, around the globe. Again, uh, the best science, no matter where it's being done, all focused on Lee syndrome in some way. And particularly meaningful to me is that we had um, – previous awardees, right, from 2019 reapply because they made mm. such great progress on their first project that they wanted to come back and say, we think we can take this further now. 
So, you know, it, from a peer review process, you know, this makes it a lot easier to, you know, to make the case of, we know this investigator, we know this project, right? They, they, they demonstrated that they can accomplish their goals and now they want to move it that much further along. So we're really excited to have uh, three investigators get funded that were part of the 2019. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. I want to shout out to our, our friends at PALS, Mitocon, the Mito Foundation, Lilly Foundation. This is a global effort with leading organizations from around the globe coming together to advance this. So right. we're always grateful for our collaborators. You know, where we need so much collaboration is, is our work on Capitol Hill. And we've got a very aggressive agenda in 2022. You know, as always, the UMDF and its, its partners in DC are looking at ways to make sure that Mito is recognized in the appropriations process. We've been successful in unlocking dollars through the Department of Defense and nearly $14 million overall that we can point a finger towards in terms of Mito research being done through the appropriations process. Um, some other things on the agenda coming up, uh, continue to look at the coverage of genetic testing, the coverage of, coverage of uh, medical nutrition, and a big one that we're gonna be asking our community to really ramp up for us is around telehealth. You know, there has been some uh, restrictions that were lightened a little bit through through COVID. If there was any kind of silver linings that came out of COVID, access to the health, telehealth was an area that we saw some growth. We want to maintain right. that. And again, with our guests today, we'll probably dive into that a little bit here. Uh, but certainly, this is a place that for Mito families who experienced the the Mito crash and, and energy de depleting disease, something like telehealth can make a huge difference for our community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, many are immunocompromised. Uh, so, you know, even going to a clinic, you know, it, it, they feel a, a hesitancy or a risk associated with being exposed to, you know, whether it's COVID or just the, the common cold or flu. All of those things can be really uh, detrimental uh, to someone with mitochondrial disease. So, you know, telehealth does really open up, uh, you know, another way of, of getting uh, clinical care while mitigating some of those risks of, um, of being there in, in a larger group. Well, so much of this good work, Phil, is it's, it's can't be done without collaboration. I'm excited with our guests today to talk a little bit about collaboration, what it means to bring many organizations together um, in a spirited effort to advance uh, these very important missions. Uh, we have two special guests to us. Uh, enough alluding to our guests are, Phil. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think our first guest that I'm going to bring in here, though, I hate saying this, doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to give him an introduction anyways, right? Doesn't we talk need about it, but he deserves the, the it. The powerhouses, he deserves it, that's for sure. Dr. Bruce Cohen joins us in the powerhouse today. Uh, Dr. Cohen, and for, for the Mito community, when we talk about powerhouses, this guy helped build the house, right? This is, um, this is when we think about the, the folks who are the, as, we, as we've described, the, the vanguards of the mitochondrial disease world, um, Dr. Cohen is with us. Director of Neurodevelopment Science Center, Interim Vice President and Medical Director of the Re Rebecca D. Considine Research Institute at Akron Children's Hospital, Dr. Bruce Cohen. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Thank Cohen. You. It's great to be here. And with us today as well is Executive Director and CEO of the Child Neurology Foundation. And Amy, Amy Bren, I also, I was going through your bio, and I always have enough fun with you when we're on calls because I think you're just a, a a great personality, one of my favorite people in the patient advocacy space, Amy <laughs> Brand. But I like this from your bio, and I'm, I figure it's public, so I can share it. Yeah. <clears throat> dot, dot, dot. And if you asked Amy what is the most important, she'd most likely convey her strong belief that there's never a bad time to eat pizza. And mm. I can't agree with her. So. <laughs> Thumbs up, <laughs> Amy. Welcome to the podcast. We're gonna get into we're gonna get to know you a lot better, Amy. Besides your favorite pizza topic, but go ahead and give it to me to kick off the podcast. Um. Well, so I have two young boys, six and three. So typically, I eat just cheese pizza. But if yes. I'm gonna have some adult time, I love a good pepperoni um, with hot peppers and feta. Oh, that's a nice combo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen the hot peppers and feta one yet. Our family's <laughs> going through that phase too, where the pizza bill, the Friday night pizza bill is like oh, yeah. $60 because there's 
six different types of pizzas that to order to satisfy everyone's needs. But you need to set boundaries. I do, right? <laughs> <laughs> but enough about that. We've got really important things to cover today. Uh, we're grateful to have you both with us today as um, we can share a little bit, of, little bit about our respective organizations and what we've done together. And I'd love to just chat today a little bit about the future of healthcare and patient advocacy groups and what we do to help move these missions forward and what we can do more together. I thought it'd be good just to kind of kick things off, Amy, by getting to know you a little bit more in your organization. Tell me a little bit about your um, your journey to the Child Neurology Foundation. Sure. Um, well, I for, it for sure was not linear and it was not intended. I actually am um, a, a board certified advanced practice nurse in pediatrics and in palliative and hospice medicine and was just absolutely in love with my clinical practice. Never thought I would leave. I um, actually went into nursing school knowing I wanted to subspecialize working with families facing life-threatening or limiting conditions. I was, I started my career actually because I couldn't find a job, and I and I answered a call on Monster.com. Do you remember back? I'm aging yes. myself. But remember Monster.com? And I put in an application to um, the American Academy of Pediatrics. You know, not too shabby of an organization, mm -hmm. and somehow I got hired. I should not have. I was 22 and I was I, they had me running grants from Shriners Children's Hospitals across the country. I was um, helping educate primary care physicians on how to set up systems of care for in their practice for children with special health care needs. I couldn't even run a car when I would travel. Right. I mean, I, I absolutely should not have had this job, but I was surrounded by like really smart, caring people, a lot of mentors. And I kind of moved my way up. Um, and got into policy. And it was at the time where um, the, the first um, Secretary's Council on um, Heritable Disorders was established, you know, kind of that unifying core panel for newborn screening. And these people were showing up in the office and they were like getting so mad at me that I was advocating for this. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with an expanded newborn screening panel? So I started to read the opposition's literature which was in bioethics at the time they were saying, and you'll, you'll understand this from the Mito angle. They were saying, if there's not a cure, you shouldn't give the mm. diagnosis. And I was like, this is radical to me. So then that led me into learning about pediatric palliative care. And I was astounded at the time that less than 10% of our hospices actually accepted children at the end of their life. They were too afraid to provide them care. And that just triggered something in me. So went back to school. And I just loved it. Loved, loved, loved my clinical practice. Um, long story short, I ended up, I was running a hospice in um, Dallas, Texas, a long way from home, grew up in Chicago. And I get a call from my last clinical manager in Kentucky. And she says, there's a man on the phone. Girl, there's a man on the phone that wants to talk to you. He's from Child Neurology Foundation in Minnesota. Can I give you his number? And I said, sure. <laughs> and um, the rest was history. I was actually hired to come to the foundation for 90 days and help write some grants on hmm. transitions of care. I had done some previous consulting work on that. And um, then at the time, we had this phenomenal physician on our board named Don Shields. And he just wanted to kind of revitalize the foundation and so do you want to stick around for a little bit longer? And here I am, my seventh year. Fantastic. So tell us a little about the mission of the Child Neurology Foundation, where your organization spends your time. So we really aim to be this collaborative hub, if you will, this collaborative touch point for the whole child neurology sector, really aiming to provide a lot of education and support to patients and families living with all neurologic conditions. We are, we like to say we're diagnostic we're, we're agnostic in our disease, right? So the full scope, any neurologic condition that affects children, we're in it for you. It could be your primary, it could be your secondary. But also we explicitly target and work with the medical professionals that care for these children and families. And that's obviously where we're so blessed to work with physician leaders like Dr. Cohen, who serves on our board of directors. We are the only non-for-profit in the neurology sector that was started by and actively governed by physicians. So we have this very unique lens that we operate from. Like we stand in collaboration, right? We, we want that better tomorrow for children. 
And we know that the sweet spot to get there is where we can find points of interconnectedness from the family um, experience and what the needs are for the uh, for the physicians. So we do um, education and support programming. We also do a lot of convening. And I think that's where we've really come together as partners, where we bring multi-stakeholders together to talk about issues like you were talking about earlier, telehealth, transitions of care, um, access to critical therapies that you know affect anyone on the disease spectrum. And then from those kind of points of convergence, that's where we build our advocacy agenda from. And then we also invest in research and technology. Certainly covering all the bases from a, from a mission standpoint, keeps you busy. And you just, just like a garbage pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Dr. Cohen, you know, I, I didn't think you could possibly have any more hats to wear. There's so many hats you wear for UMDF. And, you know, as we, as I got to, to know more about you in my early days of the organization to understand the leadership role that you've taken with the, the child, child neurology groups as well, too. And I was hoping maybe you could kind of comment a little bit on on some of your work and just what you've seen with the Child Neurology Foundation over the years. So I, I got involved with the Child Neurology Foundation very early on in its existence because um, when the foundation formed, and Amy reminded me it was 2001, uh, the foundation uh, put out a call for nominations of which advocacy group is really the best um, and deserves to be recognized by the Child Neurology Foundation. And of course, I put in the name UMDF, and I wrote an app, you know, an application for it. And we we didn't get it the first year at the UMDF, and we didn't get it the second year, and we didn't get it the third year, and we didn't get the fourth year. So I finally gave up. And on the fifth year, I got a call from someone at the foundation or an email saying, you know, you didn't apply this year. You, you know, you didn't nominate the UMDF. Um, are you? And I said, well, I, I gave up. They said, please put in a, a, a nomination <laughs> board, and the UMDF won that award and I, I believe it was 2007 uh, where the award was uh, presented to the UMDF. So that's my initial involvement with the foundation. You know, fast forward many years, I'm now president of the Child Neurology Society. Mm -hmm. And um, in that role, uh, and that's a, a physician led organization for physicians. Um, uh, but in that role, I get to have a seat on the board of the Child Neurology Foundation. You know, the other thing that we're, we're going to be get, getting into health policy a little bit today, I think, is that I also serve as chair of the advocacy committee of the American Academy of Neurology, uh, which is a 38,000 member group. And advocacy really means a lot of different things. But one of the big things it means is government relations mm -hmm. and, um, and, and health policy and so forth and so on. So, you know, my, my life is, I've worn many hats in my life, but you, you get one chance to go around and I, I'm gonna take advantage of everything I can do, um, in, in this case for the uh, children and adults with mitochondrial disease. We talk a lot about keeping that drum beat going and, and amplifying that drum too. And it certainly is our respective organizations and in, in your case, Amy, representing many different diseases too, where they're entering into um, this, an era where there's so much more activity happening. The, the advocacy piece of this becomes even more critical in an ever-changing uh, healthcare landscape too. And I, I'm hoping maybe let, let's just go down that path right now, right? And we were talking about this from the very beginning. And maybe I'll pose it this way. I don't want to talk about COVID anymore, but coming out, let's, let's talk about coming out of it. Like what, what are going to be some of our moves that we are going to make based on what we know now? What's, what are some of the, the driving points of, of, of healthcare moving forward? I'd love to hear your guys' perspective on that because I know you're both very close to you know, monitoring the, the trends and the, the points that are, um, that are driving the, the healthcare landscape right now. So I'm going to let Amy go first. But before Amy takes the microphone, I'm going to say anchovy. <laughs> I didn't Just ask, shame on me. Listening. And I also didn't nice. get that collaborating since 2007 t-shirts. I should have got that for the paddock yeah. podcast. So sorry. Hashtag. Hashtag, yes. <laughs> um, so I'm a Pollyanna. I mean, I always can see, and I'm looking for that glass half full. And mm -hmm. so for me, uh, for the foundation, we see a lot of um, opportunities that, uh, you know, COVID has illuminated, we like to call them resets that are possible in the healthcare system. And we'll just kind of, since we 
mentioned, telehealth will stay there. Um, so do we do a national needs assessment every year in, in 2021? We had about 2,000 families respond to it, about 300 physicians. And when we asked about telehealth, you know, what the, what we heard back was everyone loved it for convenience, right? Exactly what you all talked about before. Mm -hmm. um, about a third of the respondents, though, that were families said that if given the chance, they would never, ever, ever use telehealth. Interesting. And we were like, what? What, what does that even mean? And when we dug deeper into it, it was really that they were feeling that disconnect from their physician. And really that goes back to why we advocate for the, the importance of building that strong family provider um, relationship. So when we advocate federally about telehealth, we bring forth that data, right? To really talk about one size isn't gonna fit all, right? We're not gonna all do telehealth or all do face-to-face. -face. Like we right. have to have a conversation with both stakeholder groups about what works. The other thing that I've stumbled into when I've met with some um, legislator staff that I was not expecting, so I'd be totally interested if you all have experienced this, is when they start talking about, well, we're gonna start slashing telehealth because we don't wanna pay for it. And okay, tell me why. And immediately they'll go into talking about adult patients um, with chronic conditions, let's say cardiovascular health. And my mind goes wild. I mean, I just want to go like banshee on, but I, you know, I have to pull it together because I'm like, what you're talking about, that sort of patient need and patient visit is so dramatically different than the a regular follow-up visit, even for our chronic condition patients, right? Like our patients as a whole see three to 10 specialists. Like telehealth can be a mechanism for even assisting in care coordination, right? These are high utiliz utilizers of the healthcare system. How can we utilize telehealth to actually drive efficient, coordinated, comprehensive care? Please do not lump our patients right. into an, an older patient that's following up with their blood pressure medicine, which might need a telehealth visit, you know, but it's not one in the same. So we do a lot of, I feel like, fundamental education about the needs of these children. Um, and then the last thing, of course, I say, um, I think as well, moving forward in advocacy on whatever topic, we really have, uh, I think, an, uh, an opportunity to bring forth not just one voice, right? So not just mito voice, not just, you know, neuromuscular voice, not just the patient voice, not just the physician voice, but when we can build and put forth the synergies of the stakeholders like when you, we've got physicians and families saying the same thing, right. boom, I think that's way more impactful than the typical way where it's like kind of just, you know, myopic, we're in our lane, we're just gonna bring forth our data. So, some, in some case, we just don't have any choice but to, but to come together, right? right. Like there's, there's, there's too much work to do and it's, and it's a big lift as well too. Bruce, your commentary on the, on the telehealth front. Sure. So. Um, there, there are three things that are happening in healthcare today that are going to be driving um, a lot of what we are going to be doing. And the first is um, health equity. And um, telehealth is actually probably the number one thing I can think of, which is going to help bring us towards health equity. What, what does that mean? Uh, that means we want all of our patients to be VIP patients right. and have access to the best medical care that uh, they can possibly get possibly get. And where telehealth comes into, you know, play is that it, it can bring people who live in Appalachia into the uh, physician's, physician's office in a virtual office type of sense. And, um, you know, that that's critical. Now, telehealth has been in existence since Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone. And there's actually a mechanism. There's been a mechanism for 30 or 40 years for physicians to actually submit a bill uh, for telephone services, but insurance companies haven't paid for it. So if you're not going to not going to get paid for it, why submit a bill? But we've been doing telehealth for for years. Uh, but when it, when the audio video technology was initially developed for telehealth, the insurance companies took a stance like this: that we're not going to we're not paying for it. And, um, and, you know, it was, it was probably a lot about the money and, um, the technology started to develop very slowly. So Medicare said, we'll pay for stroke telehealth in rural communities. So if you're in a rural community and you have a stroke, um, they'll pay for 
a hookup with a stroke neurologist who's sitting at home with their computer, does the examinations, make sure it's safe, and the patient gets TPA. And all of a sudden, patients who would never have been able to have access to that equitable medical care were getting the best medical care, but only if they lived in rural communities. And then Medicare finally said, okay, well, stroke anywhere because it takes longer to get to a doctor if you're living in New York City than it does if you're living in rural Montana because who can get to, you know, who can get through that traffic? So we, the big medical centers had in place the technology for doing telehealth, but no way to actually bill for anything but stroke until Hmm. COVID-19 hit and the pandemic hit. And then one day we get an email from Health and Human Services, Medicare, basically saying, hey, everybody, the states, you can waive your medical license restrictions. As long as someone has a license to practice medicine in one state, it's up to you guys, but they can practice in any state. And number two, all insurance companies are going to start having to pay for this uh, because otherwise no one can get to the no one can get to their their provider. And so I think that occurred on March 6th. Within a week, um, we had converted almost all of our patients over to telehealth services in, in our in our medical center. And um, you know that's that's one way to bring health equity to play to places and to children and, and adults who can't get out of their house um, for for whatever reason. We're still you know we're we're, we're not, now that the pandemic is down the state just may have lost to Bruce here for a second but I'm sure he'll come right back on here I'm back there he is I'm back. <laughs> we got you <laughs> yeah sorry about that there's several initiatives in front of Congress yeah certainly a hot topic right now congressionally you know Phil we were talking about this at the, at the top of the show um from my understanding that it continues to be this like um, 90 day reapplication until they figure out what's going to be going on with this. Right. It's something our, we're pushing our advocates to do. And, and Amy, we talked about collaboration opportunities. I can't agree more. I think something around you know, telehealth and access to care is clearly a place where um, organizations, organizations like ours can come together. And this is a place I'm sure you've kind of unleashed your advocates as well too, in just helping our, our leaders understand what this means for, for patient families. Go ahead, Dr. Cohen, did you want to continue? Yeah, so it was getting into the second point is that um, I live in a really nice place. I've got great broadband connectivity. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to say. Well put. Irony is not lost on us here. Yes, yes. <laughs> but, but, um, but not a lot of, not a, especially in rural communities, they don't have broadband uh, right. capabilities. So health equity would also require building up of the infrastructure um, mm. So we, we need a payment model um, to make it fair. We need broadband availability. And, and so I think health equity is uh, a real um, important part of this equation. And again, there, there are bills in front of Congress um, to address this. Mm-hmm. So what the pandemic did is cut through 10 years of legislative and regulatory baloney right. and put telehealth um, availability in, in, our, in our hands. Um, I can get to the other. Um, yeah, I want to toss back to Amy and just kind of yeah. understand, Amy, how how you all um, galvanize your patient community to help advance some of these initiatives. Well, so here's a here's an example of kind of how we take um, a need, go into a program, get right. the data, and then share it with the community. So a little bit of what Dr. Cohen was just talking about with families. While telehealth has created increased access, so we knew pre-COVID, average national wait time to access a child neurologist was nine weeks. With Mm -hmm. telehealth, data actually shows that drops to a week. Great. But what we also saw were families living in the digital divide. It actually created a greater chasm. So we launched a pilot program uh, last year. um, Because of all the advocacy discussion about, oh, these families need increased broadband. And, And... from our data, what we were saying is it's not just an access of technology. They don't even know, some of them don't even know how to utilize the technology, mm. right? So how do we how do we also bundle that with education? So we launched a pilot project. We gave 100 families down in Appalachia, as well as inner city um, Minnesota, 
Chromebooks, um, hotspots, blah, blah, blah. We hired a staff person to be kind of a technical assistant trainer. What we learned is really how these families communicate. A lot of them, it's texting via the phone that they have, right? So we did a lot of training. But through that too, we also were assessing what are their other social determinants of health needs? So if they don't have access to technology, it's not just about they can't access their child neurologist. They also can't act, access a lot of community-based services that now also because of the pandemic are virtual. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the data we started to collect on transportation needs, access to food shelves, Medicaid, I mean, incredible. So we utilize that data, we gather it all up, and then that, and then we share that out with the community that we know is also in kind of the, I say, the choir about this. So right. we'll do as kind of that umbrella organization, we'll do the heavy lift of gathering the data because we're looking at the unifying human experience and not just the disease experience. And then we share that human experience out. Um, And then, you know, either we'll do some sign on letters, we may do some webinars to help educate and kind of connect. We may also develop some family education out of that. But then, because the other thing we've experienced, Brian, for sure is, you know, fundraising got totally great during the during COVID. So a lot of advocacy organizations are having to rethink their whole operational structure because so especially they, if you're a special event focused totally organization. Yeah, totally. So what we've also um, found out is if we can do the lift, we, we got away from doing event fundraising seven years ago, mm-hmm. not because we knew what was happening. It was <laughs> kind of random yeah. But if, cause so if our resources stayed stable, we could do that heavy lift of creating those resources and then share it with our disease specific advocacy partner that they could then just tailor it to their community. So that's the other way that we try to really collaborate and, and get truth out there for people. That is uh, what a awesome program. Phil, you can thank Amy and we'll have, we'll have Kara strip matter, our director of education. Thank Amy for me just giving you all a new job. I mean, what a, what an awesome project. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, through, I, right? I, I love the approach, right? Because it's it's thoughtful in its design and it's testing, uh, you know, these new approaches. Um, the goal being to generate data that are then supportive, right, of much larger initiatives and advocacy. And when you come in with data, yes, it's a, it's a much stronger case, right, than just Absolutely. you know words. So, uh, uh, kudos. Uh, Thank to you. Your, well, we're in the process of expanding it to all 50 states. So if you all want to jump aboard and be part of it, let's chat after. There we go. We we'll put in the show happen. notes, like they say, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk a little bit about that patient voice, right? We talk about it from an advocacy standpoint. We talk about the, the power of showcasing the disease. Bruce, you and I have talked about this as being a, another place that you see being a really important tenant of, of what's going to be driving healthcare moving forward is, is the power of the patient voice. I was hoping you could comment on that a little bit. I think we've got you on, on uh, mute, Dr. Cohen. There you go. Thank you. I, I think that's the second point and that's consumerism. And uh, how many of us mm-hmm. have been inside a bank recently? I refinanced my house. I never got right. anywhere near a bank. I called someone on the phone. They sent me electronic things I could sign them. Look, we, we don't do that anymore. When I was a kid growing up, you go to the eye doctor, go to the regular doctor. You you counted on a one to two or three hour wait in the doctor's office. And we got mad, but you couldn't get too mad because they were the doctor. Yeah. That would not fly anymore in, in, in today's you know uh, society. Uh, the voice of the consumer is, um, again, uh, become the driving force. Part of this has been because we now have Dr. Google, people can look mm-hmm. stuff up and get really good information off the internet. You know, some of the information on the internet isn't great information, uh, but a lot of it is. And I think this is where uh, both the CNF and UMDF have been really driving forces in the voice of the patient. Because when the patient comes in with knowledge of their illness, um, the patient gets better care. It, it, it's just that that's just the way it is. Um, and and I love it when patients come in with well-constructed questions that they got because they they read a Web page. Right. Uh, so I, I think we're changing the way we practice. We're changing the way we schedule patients. 
We're moving to online scheduling. We're moving to virtual visits. We're actually going to be opening up portals with our patients, um, electronic portals with the electronic medical record where we can actually answer questions in real time. And again, in the past, uh, physicians have been reluctant to think about doing it this way because it takes up time. But now the insurance companies are, are saying, yeah, we'll, we'll pay for that uh, type of communication. Anything to put the person in touch with their provider so that they have better access to health care when they need it, not four times a year, but when they need it um, is something that we're going to be seeing uh, in the future. Yeah, the expectations are just rapidly changing, right? I was yeah. I was remarking the other day to my wife, we were I was ordering tennis balls on the Amazon, and it was going to take like six days, and I was losing my mind because I because I couldn't have the tennis balls in three days, right? And I think about a lot about that in in our world where, you know, sure I was annoyed and I was devastated my tennis balls weren't coming in a quick enough time, but think about a panicked parent, right, who needs information. Who needs an appointment? Who needs things now? Like those are the folks who do deserve to get that that instant connection. And I know, Amy, that's a place you guys are focusing on is trying to find more ways to uh, to be more efficient as an organization to connect with the clinical community and the patient community. We talk about patient education. There's a parallel track on clinician education as well, too. And I was hoping you might be able to comment a little bit, Amy, on, on what CNF does from a clinician education standpoint. Yeah, so and this this kind of goes back to exactly what um, Dr. Cohen and, and you, Ryan, were just talking about. So I don't really remember how I first heard this saying, but somehow it resonated deeply within me. It's a quote that I believe JFK made originally famous. Mm -hmm. It's the rising tide lifts all boats. Right. And so it's really the thought of um, in a storm that really... Uh, in the complexity of the of life that these children and families are navigating, how can the rest of us in the sector kind of come together and lift them up to give them a breath and kind of move them farther down in their journey? And one of the ways that we believe we can do that is really through this multi-stakeholder education. So in the past, the foundation, because we do these national needs assessments, and then our board looks at the data and says, here's some real key issues that are affecting the whole community. And they typically in years past have picked one. And then we launch what's called an annual education initiative. So the last two years, for example, um, we've done this in partnership with the Child Neurology Society, and it's, it's about shortening the diagnostic odyssey. So what you guys were talking about earlier in, right. in, the, um, in the call. We then start out again in trying to identify data, really understand this issue from both perspectives. So in that initial year, what we found out is for our community, um, about 33% of families waited an average of three years to find a diagnosis, 50% mm. five years. Within that, 44% of families had at least one misdiagnosis. So what does that do to their process, right? They, they're living in this ambiguity, then it's stress, and you add to it data that they tell us that 50% of the 2,000 respondents live in a crisis mode weekly. That crisis mode has nothing to do with the medical condition. It has everything else to do with life that goes along with living with the neurologic condition. You go over and we did this uh, same survey over the Child Neurology Society. What did we find out? We found out so much data about what the provider goes through in the diagnostic odyssey, right? Not knowing which test to order or how, if we don't get one result, how do I communicate that back? Is that futile to the family, right? How, how do I handle that hope element that the family has kind of like, yes, this, this test result is going to give us the answer. You also have to realize a lot of our, the workforce, and Dr. Cohen can talk about this, you know, there's been so much innovation within pediatric CNS disease. Like these providers, what they trained in is not always mm. What is today, our past president, Scott Pomeroy, used to always talk about, we were trained to manage symptoms. Now we're managing the underlying etiology. I mean, so for, for, the, for advocacy sometimes to point fingers at physicians, it, it's really not fair, right? Because these physicians themselves are also overburdened. The data from that survey showed that 60% of the member or of the respondents that were physicians, they feel burnt out weekly. Hmm. We already have a workforce issues. Sure. So what we do with that data then is we create curriculum, 
We present it at the CNS annual meeting, as well as uh, family specific education virtually that really illuminates these points of how we converge on this issue, right? So where are the shared learnings and then also where, what are different? One of the needs, for example, that came out with families is exactly what Dr. Cohen just said. There's an assumption made that families should go in and ask for genetic testing. What we heard from families is they don't even know sometimes how to go in and talk about their diagnosis. Right. So they asked, could you develop a toolkit to help us prepare for our child neurology visit? So it's like going way back to the basics, right? So um, that has been incredibly, incredibly successful. Last year alone, we touched 700 child neurologists, 4,500 families. Within that, we pulled in over 30 advocacy partners and over 12 industry partners. So it's that rising tide lifting mm -hmm. all boats. It's been so successful that this year we're like, what the hell? We're going to do three of them. So now we're doing <laughs> no <good deed. laughs> So we're doing this year with a partnership with the Society about clinical trials. Um, the American Epilepsy Society approached us, and now we're doing a shortening the diagnostic odyssey specific to rare pediatric epilepsy. And then we're going to, for the first time, do our own CME, um, and it's going to be around care coordination. Fantastic. Driven, driven by data, leveraging technology. I mean, Bruce, we talk about this quite a bit. Is it, again, as a, as a driver in the ever-changing landscape of healthcare, is, is how AI and data plays into all of this. Absolutely, I think you know that's the the, the third key point is that um, the use of both intelligence and artificial intelligence will hopefully allow us to take better care of our patients. I, I, I know of a project that's not ready to, it's not fully baked yet, and I can't talk about the details, uh, but um, it appears just by querying, asking the question of what drugs has this child been on before, hmm. there's certain classes of medication to treat epilepsy that would predispose to a worse epilepsy hmm. later on in life. And, and so, uh, that was not a hypothesis-driven question. It was just looking at the drugs people were on early in life and what happens to them later on. And, and so um, I, I think that a lot of what's, a lot of how we're going to be taking care of our patients in the future is going to be using increasing the amounts of technology. I, I don't think we're ever going to be in a situation where, where physicians are out of jobs. Um, we still need to take care of patients, but at least we'll have the data uh, to take better care of our better care of our patients. Phil, this is a, a hub you live every day at our organization, right? The, the convergence of information and data, and, and and how we leverage it into programs and science. Yes. And just from from what you're hearing today, it's, what I'm hearing, just so many opportunities to continue to get creative. Yeah, just to, you know, reaffirms that there, there's so much data out there, but you, you have to look at both retrospective data, so sort of what's, what's locked up inside electronic health records, right, around, around the country. You know, how do we unleash those, right? Patients have access to them, but how do we make sense of those records? How do you extract useful information from this volume of, of, of data? There's so many activities around this that, you know, or using machine learning uh, to to facilitate that it, it's clear what the future holds uh, on that front. And then there's the prospective piece, right? If we're going to collect data going forward, how do we do that in a way that's meaningful, harmonized, um, useful for, you know, particularly in the case of something as complex as mitochondrial disease, um, you know, that charts the natural history, right? So that we better understand how these dis diseases progress over time. Um, it's all about the data and um, it's, it's that interface of uh, technology, uh, data and the needs of a, of a, of a disease community. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Well, it requires leaders who can move very fast and uh, clearly we're fortunate with leaders like Amy and, and, and Dr. Cohen of having that type of mindset, right? To be thinking about that's that's boring, that's lame. Let's think of a different way to do this, right? To ask those questions and, <laughs> and get creative and, and leveraging that information. So I wanna, I wanna pose this as kind of a, a way to, to wrap our conversation. 
what are we missing on the on the roadmap to you know addressing pediatric neurological conditions? What else can we be doing? Amy, when I think about you know, an organization like ours, what we can be doing to help you, how we can bring our communities together, love to get your thoughts on that. Ooh, it's like, <laughs> gosh. We need another hour. What's my, what's my dream list? Yeah, right? sure. <laughs> well, and first I should say, I should get your Venmo account because you've been so generous with these compliments. I'm pretty uh, sure I owe you something. <laughs> but I I'm a clear fundraiser as well, yeah. too. <laughs> And vice versa. You've always yes. been so open every time I've reached out to, to chat. You know, this might be very simple, but I'm kind of, I kind of believe sometimes the, the biggest impact comes from the simple truth. Hmm. Um, and I was, I started to think about this actually a couple of years ago, and I just didn't really have the courage to say it out loud because I knew it wouldn't be popular. But now I'm kind of like, eh, <laughs> we'll just throw it out there. But um, in terms of uh, roles of advocates in the rare disease community, especially organizations like ours that are considered more of the umbrella organization. Mm -hmm. I think it, it would be really powerful if we could help um, advance a narrative that negates the perception that these patients and families start their journey as rare disease patients. Mm -hmm. They start their journey because there's a symptom out of control. There's a burden within their body that's saying like something's going on here. And we know, you know, that 90%, we now know 90% of the identified rare diseases have a neurologic component that starts in childhood. So we know a lot of the times they're ending up on people's doorsteps like Dr. Cohen. And, and I think if we could help create that narrative a little bit more, it again begins not only to frame all of this advocacy work in the truth of the patient journey, but it also creates um, an opportunity for patients and families that are on that diagnostic odyssey to, if they have to wait three, five, ten, they do not feel alone because they know they're already part of a larger community. And then that, by being part of that community, we can help do exactly what Dr. Cohen said, start educating them, having them feel supported. You know, I read recently that the feeling of isolation is, can be considered equal to leading a premature death as um, diabetes, cardiovascular effects. I mean, isolate the feeling when you're isolated and you're alone is devastating to your overall health. So I almost think like, I know that's very, very basic and it's more of a human perspective, but we do sometimes get so caught up in let's get that right diagnosis. Let's talk about clinical trials. Let's, mm. that we, we miss that kind of core foundational aspect of the patient and family um, journey. And I just am curious if we did a better job of that would they then be more apt to opt into a clinical trial or, you know, whatever the new innovations are, because they're not so um, drained. I think it's, it's sage advice. I mean, Phil, I think about the, um, oh, the slide I have pretty much at the end of every one of my presentations of staff meetings, board meetings says go fast, right? We always talk about going fast because we have a certain energy that we want to provide right. for the mm -hmm. community, but it does require us to, to pause and get back to basics. Mm -hmm. And it does require us to, to make sure we're always patient-centered, first and foremost. And sometimes that means you know, getting to the very core of what these organizations were built to do. And that's to wrap around these patient families. And what I'm hearing so much from you today, Amy, and we've always heard from you, Dr. Cohen, and I hope it's the spirit of what UMDF does. That's not just a broad stroke, right? There's so many different types of patient family experiences, not just diseases, but experiences right? Where dad just lost a job as well, right? And, and brother struggling in school. And we have a devastating disease on top of that. Like, how do we continue to wrap around the family in our approach, realizing that it's somewhat bespoke? It's not just this totally. big, broad approach to, Dr. Cohen, I'm going to end with you. What else are we missing? What, tell, tell us, I want to hear your, I want to hear your dreams in, a, in the few minutes we have left. Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of perspective. One of the things the UM UMDF did, you know, 25, 26 years ago, and what the CNF is doing now is it's building a platform for communication. So with the, the UMDF symposium, the idea was to put researchers, clinicians, and families affected by the disease all in the same room for a few days together. And one of the most 
the, you know, I had been doing, taking care of people with mitochondrial disease for several years. I met this young researcher, PhD student. He, he, he looked like he was 19 years old uh, and, and dressed like, you know, a 19 year old would dress. <laughs> I was presenting a poster at a scientific meeting. He came up to me and goes, you mean people have mitochondrial diseases? He's been working on yeast models of mitochondrial dysfunction. <laughs> and, and, and so it was, I, I think it just highlights that um, if you create that platform for communication, it, it, everyone, um, everyone's boats rise up, as, as, as Amy put it. So, uh, and the CNF has been doing that in their conferencing um, uh, and, and, and buildings and, and building um, uh, um seminars and symposia around topics that are really patient centric. Um, and sometimes, frankly, um, physicians miss the boat on that. Uh, and, and um, you know, uh, the transition of care uh, that was done several years ago is a great example. Uh, the diagnostic odyssey, uh, which is coming up, uh, not the diagnostic, but the uh, clinical trial readiness, which is coming up. Mm -hmm. In, in, in September is another great example. So I, I don't think we're missing the boat. I think we're doing what we need to do and we need to keep giving that effort and coming up with new ideas. Well, clearly you both are putting in the work and uh, we're grateful to have leaders like you that we can connect with on our own initiatives. And Amy, I'm leaving this call a little more inspired of other ways we might be able to connect as well too, feverishly oh. writing down notes. I know Phil just like telepathically has it into his notebook right now. He's, he's, already moving, but he's doing it as well. He's got a better memory than I do. We'll put it that way. Uh, I'm really delighted to have you both with us today. I'm going to leave with this really important thing to cover. Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Yes, absolutely. Yes. That's my daughter's favorite is pineapple on her pizza. No. I don't discriminate against it either. Oh, I like see that one. <laughs> it gets a bad rap, but I'm going to give you a combo to leave you here. Jalapeno <laughs> pepper and pineapple together. Yes. It creates this really interesting bond on pizza. Uh, can I can I add something to that? Yeah, yes. <laughs> okay, do that, and instead of red pizza sauce, pesto. Oh, here we go. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> We're all ready to go. This, this I think I know what's for dinner tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Pizza night. Thanks so much, Amy. Thanks so Thank much, you. Bruce. Thank you. Oh, Phil, we covered so much today on the yeah. front end, of course, um, all the great happenings here at, at UMDF. And, you know, we talk a lot about collaboration. And, you know, the funny thing about it, like, it, it seems to be like a thing you see on strategy documents and you see as part of uh, things you need to do it. Um, you know, as you're preparing your annual plans, but like you got to see the work too, right? You got to start putting it together. And what I really appreciate about our friends at the Child Neurology Foundation is they're always looking at ways to engage other organizations. And of course, this is at the heart of what Bruce does, right? He's He finds yeah, ways yeah. to connect with people to advance our mission. Yeah, I have to say, you know, I'm, I'm not usually a shrinking wallflower. You know, I love to talk, and but I could just sit back and just yeah. listen. <laughs> to those to, you know, talk. Uh, right. and, and I really enjoy just hearing their perspectives uh, shared back and forth. Um, you know, I'm, I'm left with just the, you know, the, the realization that we're, we're a community of communities of yeah. communities. Maybe it sounds a little meta, but, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. here we are, you know, trying to represent this diverse community of mitochondrial disease patients, but knowing that there's a community of of pediatric patients with neurological symptoms and that the CNF cares for them and that we have overlap and that we're well served, right? To find ways to, to partner uh, with organizations like that. You want to find a way to partner with organizations like that. So I'm, um, I'm really excited about the future and that we can do more things like that. Yeah. I think as we, you know, as we were talking at the front of the show about our 2022 congressional agenda, I mean, what a perfect place to be bringing all these voices together as we're you know, trying to amplify that, raise that voice to those making decisions affecting right. these patient families. There's a lot that can be done. When we look at a lot that has been done because of that. Like that's what's really important to note here. I think about the dollars we've been able to help unlock because we have educated those who are making decisions that are impacting our families. It's, it is uh, exponential. It really is. Well, this has been an awesome conversation. 
Um, again, thanks everyone for tuning in to this episode of The Powerhouse. A, a special thanks to our guest, Dr. Bruce Cohen and Amy Brenner of the Child Neurology Foundation. You can find this episode, all of our episodes on our YouTube channel. Check out our Facebook, our LinkedIn, our Twitter, and Instagram, where we talk about all this great work that's being done. And we highlight these good partners doing good work for so many patient families. We're counting on us to do just that. Until next time, everyone, go fast. Thank you.